All right, so welcome everybody to the first official open uh, mutation salon for the mutations community and mutations podcast. It's good to see you all. Uh, I see some familiar faces. I see some new faces. Uh, thank you all for for joining me this afternoon for a very exciting opening session. We're going to be speaking today with Brant Stickley and Barbara Carlson, my two good friends, my integral Gepsarian colleagues. Um, Brandt practices Chinese medicine, and he was a guest teacher on the recent Cohering the Radical Present course, which is still going on. And Barbara Carlson is a somatic therapist, an embodiment teacher, uh, and I would say an integral yoga scholar because just the, the, the marvelous way that you elucidate um, integral yoga from Sierra Bendo and, and the mother um, have been deeply informative for me. And both of you have really been very inspirational for me in terms of thinking about the embodiment dimension of integral consciousness, right? In this sort of extended tradition, linking um, Sri Aurobindo, Mira Alfasa, um, uh, Jean Gepser, of course, this sort of integral milieu. And the three of us are kind of, we, we already had a little trialogue on Rune Soup, which sort of set things going. Then you're both on the course. And then we're like, well, we need to continue this conversation. We need to just keep having these. So here we are again. And I thought, why not make this a community event? So I'm just going to welcome you both. First of all, welcome, Brent. Welcome, Barbara. Hey, I just want to add, you know, today's the 24th of November. And that's Sri Aurobindo's victory day, the oh seed my gosh. Wow. Um, that upon which one commemorates the descent of Krishna, which, <laughs> which um, or his perception of Krishna, his direct perception of Krishna as a descent. Um, so wow. always, always following the resonance of Sri Aurobindo, whether mm. we like it or not, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> Did you uh, ever read that that William Irwin Thompson, uh, I think he wrote it in one of his later books where he was talking about when he was starting Lindisfarne Association back in the 70s, wow. and he had a dream of the mother, uh, and the mother showed up and said, Lindisfarne is going to be, you know, part of what Oroville is doing, is going to be part of our work. And then Thompson, the dream was like, hey, wait a second, I got my own idea. And then the mother zaps him with some kind of shakti in the dream and makes him spin around like a whirling dervish. Uh, and that was the end of the dream. But I think he got the message, like, whether you like it or not, you're you're participating in this, you know. Um, and maybe a context, too, uh, as well, we could we could also mention at the outset here that Gebser himself felt after learning about Aurobindo that his own realizations, his own um, inspirations and peak experiences around integral consciousness may have been from Aurobindo's emanation, right? The, the, the awakening that Gebser felt he, he owed it to, or at least he credited it to Aurobindo's work. So yeah, the connections there, um, explicit and implicit, occluded and, and uh, um, you know, historical seem to be intertwined in a beautiful way. So no surprise, no surprise we are <laughs> layering into this or threading into this. Um, so where do we begin with this conversation? I know we have three topics, right? We wanted to explore what is the a perspectival body? Um, how is this related to becoming planetary? And then the third question, Barbara, you phrase it well, uh, how did, uh, how did you say it exactly in terms of our third point? Cause I have embodying integral consciousness, uh, embodying integral time, but I think you had a certain angle on it. Well, I think um, if we're, is it all right if I begin? Yeah. Oh, I yeah, absolutely. Right yeah. And so, so um, yeah, I mean, I just submitted a paper yesterday, actually, uh, on a perspectival body. So I've been thinking about this a lot. So, you know, um, the human being is kind of the only species that can sort of live a disembodied reality. That means the thinking mind can be separated from the feedback of the body. So that's what makes us unique as human beings. But at the same time, um, it can be seen as, as some kind of um, thing that can uh, sort of take over. And I think we're seeing that now in uh, the state of the world that we've had this 
overemphasis on the rational and the intellect. And we've kind of left, you know, the body or the embodied mind behind. So the embodied mind is a mind that is open to feedback from the body. And that feedback is electrochemical, it's genomic, it's neurological, it's emotional, it's feeling, it's passion. These are the things that have developed over hundreds of thousands of years and have survived in our human uh, species. And they have been really instrumental in us for doing things differently. I mean, if we didn't feel passionate about what was happening, we would just be like robots going into the end. But because things are have gotten so far away from anything we can call human, or, uh, you know, sort of respect or a sense of belongingness with this planet, um, if we didn't feel, if our hearts didn't feel, you know, the, the sort of gravity of what's happened, we wouldn't try to do anything different. So I think to, to really um, address the complex issues and hard problems of our time, we have to include the body. We have to include our human species wisdom. And that human species wisdom includes empathy and it includes a sense of belonging and meaning. And it includes an identification with the planet, the planetary body, or the sense of one body of life. Beautiful. Beautiful. Brant. So, yeah, I just would, I, I can't, certainly can't disagree with any of that. And I'd have to say that um, there's also a very, we have a very clear and a very clear analogy. And before launching into it, we have a very clear analogy on the physiological human level, the, the physical level of a human being. And before launching into it, I want to offer a bit of a content warning because this is a harsh reality. And so can I, do I have consent from all to speak about this harsh reality? We're getting thumbs up. Okay. Because it has to do with trauma and abuse. And so, um, the reality is that this quality of the, the disembodied mind, we can view it as a form of, you know, a, a form of a pathology of separation, mm -hmm. but we can also recognize that under certain circumstances, the facility that the human being has for dissociation is actually one of its most profoundly healing activities one of its most profoundly healing functions and one of its most profoundly protective functions. And beyond the, beyond the, not beyond, within those, all of those physiological dynamics that are at play in that moment, there's also another dynamic and that we, that we can't deny and that's the spiritual aspect of it. And mm -hmm. to recognize the degree to which that which we call spirit inheres in all of those physical yeah. manifestations and that the interaction of all of those systems within the body genomic endocrine circulatory neuroendocrine developmental that spirit inheres in all of them mm -hmm. and that it is available to our direct perception. That part of the integral leap is to perceive precisely within the spirit, the concretion of the spiritual within all of those nested manifestations. Mm -hmm. And the degree to which there is a fundamental traumatic crack at the base of our dissociation 
in the mental rational, it also becomes, in a sense, the means, the avenue through which we can regain entry to other structures of consciousness. Yeah. And we see this so commonly in, 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 in human experience on the individual level, right. that the traumatic experience, the near-death experience, for example, is, the, is what opens, one, opens one's consciousness to this ultimate identification of all of those functions mm -hmm. and between the microcosm and the macrocosm. So I think that's a really important. Um, Equally beautifully stated. Yeah. Yeah, actually there's, there's something I was working on yesterday and maybe I was feeling into this conversation um, because what I had wrote and I'll just share it here. Um, this is something for, uh, it's a larger piece for, for emer what is emerging uh, magazine. Um, and I was writing, I can get it up here. Here we go. Yeah. Through the shocks and quakes uh, to our ossified social imaginary, gaps and fissures momentarily interrupt us. What can we learn between the flash of lightning and the sound of thunder? Ortho orthogonal realities, new ways of making and remaking the world, time and self are encountered, if only for a few fleeting seconds of potent futurability. But it is in these moments, when the old has not yet passed and the new is still yet to come, that we ought to receive the keenest interest. So again, these gaps, these fissures, these disruptions, um, they're profoundly important in terms of how do we embody, particularly as you said, how do we embody all of the different layers, right, in the archaeology of our body, the strata that Bayo Akomalafe was recently talking about. I shared it with you both. That wonderful passage of seeing, uh, I believe there were he was talking more about identity and transraciality, but seeing the body as this process and identity as this process of becoming and mixing and intermingling, um, quite profound to think of it more in this sense. And this is all of these themes, I think, are, are, are kind of in orbit around um, seeing ourselves as these processual becomings that are interlaying these different topologies, these different dimensionalities, and really becoming more familiar with that language, more familiar with um, an artist I was recently speaking to uh, describe time as a kind of putty, right? That we are playfully creating and molding and shaping and reshaping with our hands. So, yeah, yeah I think these are very important. Yeah. And so, I think that that's what we're precisely what we're talking about is the discovery of time within those nested right. human experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to say that um, when we're talking about the aperspectival body, we're also talking about a body that now science has, you know, sort of. Um, shown is a multiplicity of species. And I just want to name sort of, you know, like 40,000 species of bacteria, 300,000 species of parasites, one, hundreds of thousands of species of fungi, and even millions of species of, of um, viruses. So we, we can't really talk about the aperspectival body without talking about this multiplicity and also this diversity of DNA, which has the capacity and capability to make new assemblages, new symbiotic, symbiotic uh, arrangements, uh, DNA transfer, um, recombinations of DNA recombinations of genetic material that is going on all the time. We are this body of becoming and uh, the becoming cannot even be uh, sequenced fully. It is emerging and changing and boundless. And we as humans have the capacity to actually influence that by our diet, by how we, how much time we spend in nature, what kind of ecosystems we actually go to to spend time. It, 
it's even affected by our pets. Our pets have their own microbiome. And then, you know, we're sort of sharing genetic microbiomes, even people that were around, we sort of influence each, each other's genome. And, you know, um, so this so sort of human in isolation is such an old concept that doesn't even, it's not even relevant anymore to who we actually are. So we really need to update uh, the new science and the new composition that science is telling us that our bodies are. It makes us even sort of question this whole germ theory. And it's really not about the germ, it's about the whole terrain. And so like, isolating people and putting masks on it's like it's sort of in the face of the new science it doesn't even make sense so there's the, so sorry the terrain is inclusive of of the germ the terrain is inclusive of the germ yeah, yeah yeah so then like not to turn it into a mask debate by any means but yeah. right like there's still this there's the we, we always have to be, I think it's imperative that we're always it, reiterating again and again that the, the terrain, the, in, within German terrain, there's the germ and there's the terrain and then there's the germ terrain. <laughs> and as far as assemblages are concerned, we have to kind of take that disruption into us. Yes, well said, uh, Brent. And um, so, yeah, I think, you know, it's kind of like Galileo when he said the earth was not the center of the universe anymore. I think we're going through that kind of paradigm shift where the whole way we've done things all of a sudden is taking a turn and we don't have the structures in place to actually help us through that. And it's almost like we're putting them in place. And that's why I love these conversations, Jeremy, and Brent because we are helping to put them into place and um, you know the, the the integral being already exists the ontology is there you know uh, we just need to live it and we need to kind of like the old structures have to kind of come apart and then the new structures have to come into place but it's like what do we do in that period when you know, the world is coming undone and we don't have the actual structures in place to allow that reconfiguration, transfiguration that needs to happen for the new world to be born. Well said, and it brings to mind that, uh, that particular line from Gepser. I, I can read it for us actually, because I've of course have the, the Kindle version of EPO up um, always for these kinds of conversations. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's a very kind of Gramsci discussion. If you guys remember what I'm referring to, um, let's see if I can get it here. Da, da, da. Strangely enough, it's not coming up. Well, you know what I'm talking about in terms of, uh, oh, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Good, good. Uh, a further complicating circumstance uh, in the realization of our stated task is inherent in the natural condition of our epoch. Since a restructuration of our form of realization is now taking place, all of its manifestations are Janus faced. On the one hand, they are still bound to the consciousness structure in force until now, which to the extent that it is deficient is now threatening to collapse. Yet they are already indebted to the new, yet only gradually emerging consciousness structure, which is in the process of formation. As a consequence, a certain confusion comes to the fore because the weakened foundations of the old manner of thinking are not yet sufficiently counterbalanced by the consolidation of the new mode of perception. And hence why I'm thinking of that famous Gramsci line, um, which essentially is describing the same kind of thing, the sort of confusion in this interim period. Um, but what does that look like? I mean, I mean, we're talking about, as you said, Barbara, and I, I say the same thing. Uh, there is this new ontology, right? There is a kind of realism that is is almost a, like dark matter in the sense that it is the shape, it is the surround, it is the new kind of organizing principle. There's a kind of logic behind it. 
and the destabilization and the destructuration of our world right now is actually a response to its reality, right? Yeah. I mean, we're talking about climate change, we're talking about the aperspectival body and the decentering of, of the human as a sort of static, individualized thing, right? It's actually, as, as Brandt was saying, this assemblage, right? We are more non-human than human in our biome, right? In our, bi in our gut, right? We have more non-human DNA than human. Uh, the sciences seem to be converging with this principle or this motif just as much as, let's say, um, you know, the, the kind of structure of feeling of our time in which time is becoming this increasing sense of anxiety. We become increasingly open to the, to, to the non-human realities of climate, to e ecology. And it's not so much that we are all awakening into this great enlightenment, right? It's, it's almost like, um, another integral scholar described it as a kind of falling, right? Integral doesn't feel like climbing higher into some new stage of consciousness. It feels like a kind of graceful falling into something. And it's like, well, how do we work with that? You know, how do we glide with that process? So even our volitionality here is not some kind of um, Promethean leap into the new in which we've stolen this power from the gods for ourselves and are stepping up into this new stage of evolution. It's rather, it's an invitation. It's an, an initiation on multiple scales and, and uh, dimensions. Mm. I like that initiation. You know, the, it reminds me of the distinction that uh, Gebser makes between Odysseus washing up on the shore and Jesus walking on the water. And um, what that and how that speaks to the move from how that speaks to the move from mythic to mental. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, I the thing that's noteworthy to me is is precisely the 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 you know there's this there's also a story about the Buddha that at the moment of his enlightenment, he touched the earth and there's a mudra that goes with the touching of the earth, right? And that's well and good. That's well and good. When you transpose that same image onto Jesus, it's that at, the, at Golgotha, his blood spilled into the earth, right? And the transformation that is brought about through that through that blood transformation. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's the same image, but, but on a much more visceral descent and a, a harrowing, you know, predisposing us to a, a, a harrowing of hell, which in our world is now a harrowing of the, anth of the reality of the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. And that's why you know that's why that image of that image of the blood is such a powerful image to me especially in the context of seeing that as seeing that as perhaps one of the most dynamic and yet substantial and yet fluid mm -hmm. systems that's functioning in all of those other microbiomes and with all of those other organisms at play yeah Mm -hmm. Is this is this a, a way for us to kind of fold in the second question or second theme about becoming the planetary, right? Because now the 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 implication of what we're saying is it really all of the human processes are interrelated with all of the non-human processes, as as that Bayo quote again from earlier talking about um, we don't live on the planet, we are the planet in its ongoing d slash materialization. So there is an element here that we're talking about that really is very concrete in the sense that becoming the planetary is not a highfalutin conceptual exercise about as much as I love, you know, talking about hyper objects or, or anything like that. There is some very, there is some intimacy here in this kind of inquiry about becoming planetary. So yeah. let's, ex let's kind of explore that. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, so this idea <clears throat> of becoming planetary means, well, we have to create the conditions for becoming planetary. 
So we've been sort of in this Cartesian, you know, dual um, sort of long haul of mechanistic science. And now all of a sudden we have new information that um, we can begin to fold in to who we are becoming. And I just wanna mention, we have so much self agency when it comes to what I'm talking about. This is where we actually um, sort of take hold of our birthright and not rely on um, sort of, you know, the medical pathologizing to sort of help us create a relationship with our bodies that has the capacity to create new life. Um, so when I say we have to create the conditions for the planetary, we have to actually undo some of the things that we have been living, which is this, you know, body mind split or this mechanistic idea of what a body is, a body divided into parts. The body doesn't know it's divided into parts. That's something we've put on it. The body is a living, breathing, whole, list, whole organism. And it's vast networks of interconnection, which means that everything is always communicating with everything and everything is always transducing and creating input and receiving output from the whole matrix of the body. So we need to kind of almost like um, self-author a new life where we begin to uh, have a relationship with our body that's not mechanical, but much more natural and much more sort of uh, the body is a life form. And how can I flourish this life form? I can flourish this life form by understanding that, um, you know, I have a natal pack with nature and cosmos, which means I need to spend time just like a child needs to be near the mother. We are the, we, you know, we have this natal pact. We cannot survive without nature. So it behooves us to spend time in nature. It behooves us to treat our body like a living, breathing organism and not like a machine, not driving it, not listening to it, not resting. And even, you know, as I mentioned earlier about diet, just choosing a diet that, you know, are similar to what our ancestors ate instead of this genetically modified processed food, which really doesn't have any nutritive value. Then we have all these allies like mushrooms, and I'm sure Bran can speak to that, you know, in Chinese medicine, a system of 5,000 years and, 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 you know, the mushrooms and herbs, the plants, the medicine of the earth is, is, is held in reverence. So becoming planetary just means taking some of the authorship of that into our lives. And it, 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 you start to feel better because <laughs> the other way we were doing it was so in paradox to who we were, really were as biological organisms. So it's almost like we have to kind of like create this new, in, this new vision of what it means to be human and then begin to actually live it. Yeah, so Brent, did you, uh, that means, yeah. you know, ultimately that means if we, you know, the, so the question is, okay, how, like, how are we going to do that? And um, that's why, that's why, again, like the, it's through recovering the sensory, it's through, in, I think it's like through investing, adve, investing the sensory this the the this so sensory tracks on to the aesthetic mm -hmm. right? aesthetic meaning in the sense of employing the senses and then there's this quality of synesthetic sensing into the capacity to perceive and not to perceive as an object but perceive within as sensation our relationship to all of those functions 
as a felt sense, as a physical sensation, which we are capable of understanding with as much of a symbolic or semiotic reach as we can invest in anything that we can see outside of ourselves by being separate and employing that perspectival knowing, right? So it's like the, the, re, the, 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 the path is through sensation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the concretization of that is to, is to be able to perceive in, is to be able to perceive to the same degree that the, the, the perspectival mental rational has given us the capacity to see all the way to the furthest reaches of the universe to then perceive that as a sensory experience internally mm -hmm. to feel ourselves anew to feel ourselves as multiple yet unified mm -hmm. and to see ourselves as a center with no periphery. Mm -hmm. And yet to also perceive constantly transforming relationships between centers and peripheries, which manifest the spherical nature of sensory relational ontology. Mm -hmm. Beautifully spoken. Uh, Adam referenced uh, Gebser's line in the chat, senseful a wearing. Um, that, that Gebser used, uh, which is just a wonderful way of phrasing exactly what you're describing here. And then elsewhere, I think you're linking this to, uh, you mentioned concretization, which is a kind of an abstract word, but what does it really mean to concretize is, is embody, right? To materialize in our incarnate state, this awareness or this structure of consciousness. So uh, for me, like I, what I've been talking about with the, with the, with the Gebser class and just all of the Gebser classes, that there's, there's no there's no thing beyond the senses that we need to concretize this. It's through the senses, right? They're, they are fully realized, actually. There's, they're almost overdetermined in that sense, like space is overdetermined by this senseful awareness, this concretization, right? Magic attunement, right? It's the listening and the hearing. It's the, the gut and intuition. It's that this is a sensation and it is also determined over determined by this senseful a wearing mythical imaging, as you're saying, like, um, not just semiotics, but like symbol making archetypes, image making. This is, this is a, a sensorial experience, even if we might say it is kind of an imaginal embodiment. So all of this has to do with really kind of coming into our senses. I mean, speaking of the, the term sense making, this is really what that's about. And so I think, you know, as a kind of separate or parallel topic, right, that this question of embodying integral consciousness, uh, it requires us to get into and through our senses and hyper illuminate them or allow them to become sensefully aware and not necessarily, as you're saying, like with a Hubble Space Telescope or with some kind of mental projection, we can see the furthest reaches of the cosmos in a material sense, but then what is our what is the sensation of seeing that? How is that folding into our, our being, right? That's the more interesting question. How do we retract that into ourselves? Okay. There's nothing wrong with the mental rational. It's, it's more of that inquiry that rent you were bringing up is okay well how does this fold into our sensorium into our sensible a wearing because then it doesn't become a problem right it doesn't become a kind of overextension uh or a projection of what we're doing in an unhealthy form right yeah it's like i said earlier that it is really difficult to have a sense of belonging as if you're alienated from your body so we know there's a rampant disembodiment in our technological modern society. And so we have to actually figure out how do we get people back into their bodies and relate, big word being relate, relate to each other and to their lives in a sensorial fashion, in a sensorial way. Right now, most people are living from the neck up. Uh, I mean, I work with movement, I work with somatic psychology all the time. And this is what I see in my practice that people are coming to me to actually to cultivate a relationship with their body. 
And definitely sensorial is one of the most direct ways that you can get somebody into their body because sensorial means I'm feeling something. But I think right now, the idea of feeling something is very scary for a lot of people um, because we're really swimming in um, a sea of uh, primal, uh, inexpressible angst. And so it's almost like people are in fight and flight. And so you can't get people into sensorial feeling if they don't feel safe. The body just does not work that way. They have to feel safe. So, but I think talking about it and creating, as you know, Brand said earlier when we began, creating permission for this difficult topic to not only be talked about, but to actually um, create a space of safety that people can bring up things like, I'm scared. I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared for my grandchildren. I'm scared for my children. I'm scared about the future, you know, and, and that's all part of uh, the difficult feelings. The, the part of uh, when I talked earlier about having a mind that is infused with feelings, even if the feelings are difficult, our ancestors faced ecological threats all the time. I mean, imagine living hundreds of thousands of years ago. I mean, you could be eaten up by tigers and, you know, so we, we, were, we were always faced with adversity and, and threats and intrusions and all kinds of things. But we, but we need to feel when it's time to, to, to make a behavioral change. And if I'm not feeling that I'm not gonna make a, I'm immobilized. I'm not making a behavioral change. So I think, you know, uh, being able to talk about the difficult and feel the difficult is part of the remediation. Staying with the trouble. Staying with the trouble as the plan <laughs> comes undone. Yeah, yeah. And I, I want to lean here uh, as well into this theme of time because what happens when we begin to attune and begin to be present to the senses, right? And explore these aesthetic experiences and impressions, participations in the different, I mean, for Gepser, that's that's the key to the structures. Uh, uh, David was was quoting uh, or linking to um, a couple of points from, from Gepser talking about a structure of consciousness and its associative organ or, or its association with the senses, right? When we do this, then, I think, you know, Gepser is attempting to articulate, well, here is how we engage with bringing the past into the present and the present itself, right? Senseful a wearing in the present is the only place you can do it. You can't, you know, offset it to, to uh, a conceptually um, abstract tomorrow. It needs to be in the present and engaged with somehow in the present. So a certain temporix is opening up um, I wouldn't say a presentism, but it's certainly an orientation towards the present, or as he says, a prelegio, right? A, an obligation to be present and to presentiate rather than a religio to bind back. It's in the present, there are layers and folds, there are becomings and latencies that in the dynamic intelligence of the present, which in which the spiritual can can uh, illuminate, we can remediate, right? It's not just us trying to figure out how things plug together in the now, it's in the dynamic living open intelligence of the spiritual in the present. The kind of rearranging that is needed is something that we participate in, right? In terms of that healing process, in terms of that dynamically transforming process in our becoming. No matter where you look, it's, it's this, orientation to the present. So a certain kind of temporix is the foundation, at least with, with Gepser's integral ontology, um, that we really have to begin to look at and consider. And hence, that's why we've been doing this in the class, which is like, let's start imagining ourselves as temporal beings and really begin to emphasize this aesthetic sense and present oriented practice. Mm -hmm. So 
so that's a little bit of a I was just scrolling through the chat and we there's this regarding the fourth dimension topic fourth dimension is freedom from time so here we are exactly in the same the same area we're looking at that you were just discussing I think is coming up through that chat and yeah it's precisely like we can be we we can recognize all of those aspects of time all of those aspects of time past present future are are enfolded in our being and they're actually reflective of aspects of the function of our being on a, that, that's the, as far as I'm concerned, that's the fundamental insight of Chinese medicine is to be able to perceive each aspect of function as a form of time, which is working on different, constantly working simultaneously on different kinds of frequencies. And so the aspect of our being right, the aspect of our bare, like just soul aspect that we are, is directly related to this existential quality of, as soon as you posit an amness, you posit what the hell even am in the first place. Where am I going? Why am I here? How did I get here? What is going to become of me? And on a fundamental level, that is actually the presence of life within you. That is the very root at which, at its most basic, life expresses itself in its awareness of itself as life. So that's the fundament of our being. There's, there's, and within that, since all of our life, from the moment of birth to the moment of death, if I may, if I can pull out the whiteboard, <laughs> here did you guys bring your whiteboards yes from there to there all the way <laughs> all the way around the circle it's all constantly present there and there's one aspect of us that is acting through its beingness in real time and that's the fight or flight and that itself it is the fight or flight response that's the adrenal response Mm -hmm. that which emerges from the renal system, right? That's kidney, that's water, that's depth. That's the doubled organ which resides in our low back, which is where we feel that mounting fear come up. Mm -hmm. And how does it do that? It does that through ascend ascending through all of those systems that you described to make it all the way to our eyes so that we can perceive, but also to feel the connection of the, you know, raising our hackles in the back of our head is enacted through the exact same thing. And that's a form of seeing as well, you know, for that to become a form of seeing. And then all of a sudden it's like, you become aware of your, this connection between your eyes and the back of your head. And it's like, oh, all of a sudden I can see behind me as well as I can see in front of me. Mm -hmm. Right? Like I can look at this, I can look out here, I can see the image of my of the painting behind me and I can see that I'm in front of part of it and I can also see the rest of it. Taking that awareness into time to be able to see the unseen parts of time, that's the fourth dimension. Hmm. Beautiful. That's it. That's it. All right, folks. That's it. Oh, we can pack it up. <laughs> um, QED. QED. <laughs> uh, maybe we could, uh, Barbara, if you if you have any comments too, and then we can we can open it up into the Q and A portion. Well, I think that um, what I would like to say to that is, um, you know, we we are living in uh, such an attenuated uh, dimension of ourselves, uh, very linear, very dualistic. We don't even inhabit sort of our side bodies or the three-dimensional aspect of our body. We sort of kind of go around like a front and a back and, you know, keep this sort of very um, flat expression um, 
to to how we 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 show up in life so as you know my work has been really about how to get people to inhabit and develop um, the other aspects of themselves the deeper aspects the aspects that we don't kind of bring to our everyday surface life um, you know the deeper soul meanings the deeper respiratory uh capacity that we probably don't really you know engage in our everyday life but sometimes I can get somebody on the floor and get them to breathe deeply into their lungs and they'll they'll be like oh my god I, I can't believe that I can breathe that deep or for that long I realize the client will say I realize that I'm breathing very little in my life. So we have these capacities and planes of being and dimensions of being that we need to cultivate. And as we open up those planes and dimensions and different parts of ourselves, different aspects of ourselves, I believe that our consciousness expands along with those areas, just like Brandt is talking about the fourth dimension I can see behind me. I call them superpowers. It's on, my teacher, Emily Conrad, um, would talk about these dimensions of our being, of our physical being, actually extend our bandwidth to be able to attune to different frequencies and vibrations in the universe that we normally wouldn't if we were just sort of sitting in the same posture, just doing the same gestures day after day, barely breathing, and probably not exercising too much other than to go to the car, get in the car, and then drive, and then get out of the car, and then sit. So this idea that our, you know, our behavior becomes very um, calcified or sort of, you know, congealed in one particular form. And then the consciousness tends to kind of, you know, just be an expression of that attenuated form when we can diversify and complexify and open up and create new lines of information, new orders of information, new interactions, new kind of, um, I love the word plenum, create this integrum or plenum of information and communication in the body that has a consciousness that goes with it. And I don't think we've fully developed those aspects of our human beingness yet. And as we open up to what science is revealing to us about the body, we get to actually participate in those frontiers. That's what my work is all about. What is a body capable of? That's the inquiry of my work. What is a body capable of? I don't know, but I know that I'm participating in finding it out. And, and people are beginning to also ask the same question, what is the body capable of? Capable of? And, and, and the superpowers brand, <laughs> the fourth dimension that goes along with that exploration. I mean, that's very exciting to me. Well, that's why I think it's like so important to to recognize Aurobindo and the mother in that because that's CDs, that's it. And to realize that it's not, you know, to realize that it's not not beyond the body. And in a way, it's like it's that's why that's why such a big part of it, such a big aspect of recapturing of discovering those let's let's change let's call them superpowers one of the big things about recovering those superpowers recovering that capacity within us is mirrored in the most 
quotidian things, like literally how we sit, how we eat, how we move, how we sleep. Do we sleep, you know, like, do we sleep in a way that's, this is a big thing, right? Like the, I, for years, I was, for years, I was saying, oh, you know what, like eight hours at night, like dark room, all this, you know, make sure you're in bed by this time, up by that time in a completely dark room as a form of sleep hygiene. When in reality, the vast majority of human life has been spent sleeping, but, you know, waking multiple times per night, getting up in the second watch, always around a fire, always a source of light in your room. You know, that's the reality and recovering that is, and when you, when, and like quite literally, when you sleep in that manner, you open yourself up to the dream life. You open yourself up to recognizing the dreaminess of this experience and its relationship to the dreaminess of our dream life experience. And they become interfused. And then the things that you can do so readily, you know, the first time I ever had a lucid dream, I was like at these like chalky cliffs of Dover or something like that. And the moment that I realized that I was dreaming, I was like, oh, okay, I'm dreaming. I could do anything. So what did I do? A backflip. <laughs> and, and then I woke up and I was like, well, that was a waste. <laughs> I wasted that. <laughs> But the fact is, like, I can't do a backflip in real life. Uh, so recognizing that that capacity, that capacity to do that could infuse into all of the aspects of our wakefulness within the dream and our dreaminess within the wakefulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the moment at, at which, that's the moment at which we can perceive, that's the moment at which we can perceive with such precision the microbiome that you can, that you could physically, physically look within a person and see the biome within them and see its activity and see its relationship to the tissue and see the tissue internally. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, now that's the analogy by which you then awaken, awaken to the consciousness that's present, the awakening consciousness that's present within each one of those cells, each one of those tissues, each one of those cells which comprise the tissue, so to speak, the body without organs of the cellular level of that microbiome. Mm -hmm. And to begin to perceive that with our direct perception. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the the description you're giving Brent with that is very much, I'm seeing what Barbara was also describing in terms of the folding, the communication, right? If we allow ourselves to be in such an opportunity of waking and dreaming multiple times in one night, there is a kind of folding and unfolding, a kind of dynamic intelligence in that, right? As you, then you begin to see into the tissue, then you begin to see into the microbiome, right? Whereas if we go to sleep one time a day, <laughs> we forget the napping, we just go to sleep at night, we wake up during the day, that that kind of polarity can very easily become a sort of, um, uh, you know, just an opposite, right, a kind of oppositionalism, well, I got to get up, uh, okay, how much sleep can I cram in because I got a tight schedule tomorrow, it, it becomes a kind of a non thing, it becomes just a necessity, rather than a kind of thing you have to com constantly flow in and out of in order to form your sense of self and your to reflect back on the waking self with the dreaming self, and vice versa, and that sort of dynamism. So this sort of folding and unfolding is very, very important. And I would say it's almost I think we are kind of speaking of as a sort of subtext here, a, a model, not only for the way in which consciousness functions, but also a way in which we can practice in terms of, well, how can we vivify and intensify those kinds of experiences where we are dynamically folding different structures into one another in a, in a way which invigorates and over determines them right. in this sort of transparency that we're describing. Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting for, I think, for a lot of us. And I think in, in this context of the class we've been doing, it's like, I'm not saying it's a static model, but it does seem to be 
a, a model that is emerging here. And we talk about the fold quite a bit. I know that's from Deleuze. I know that's from Devashish a little bit from um, uh, the seven quartets of becoming. Uh, so I think it's a very useful analogy, but then it's also like, it's not a, it's not an abstract thing. It's like what we're doing all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I love particular, I particularly love the idea of fold and even super fold. Um, because the thing is when we are folding in these different causal processes like individual causal processes like the cardiovascular the muscular the um, lymphatic we're folding those in which are sort of differentiated parts of of a whole but we're also folding in an identity with the whole i mean when you actually stop to think about that that's kind of mind-blowing so each time I fold in some kind of, you know, biophysical process in my body through movement, I'm, that's what I use, movement, then not only am I creating a biogenesis that's created from the causal processes, I'm also folding in an identity with the whole, because as I said earlier, the body does not recognize it's divided into parts. That's a human construct that we put on the body. The body operates as a whole. And each time I fold in the individual biological processes, whether it be muscular or bone, I'm also folding in an identity with the whole. And that whole is never superseded, which means that it is all of the experiences of evolution since the beginning of time and the ones that are still ongoing. Because we are far from being finished. We are unfolding and becoming. And we are becoming individual and we are also becoming whole. An identity with a multiplicity and also with a whole. I mean, that's even, my brain can't even really fully <laughs> comprehend that, but uh, that's really what's happening, right? Brent? <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's an identity with the whole, but there's also all these differentiated parts. I'm with you 100%. Hey, yeah. he says that hundred <laughs> percent. Or then at least I know nine and forty-four one hundredths percent. <laughs> Do we want to open it up for questions? I know uh, I'm, I'm just I'm loving our conversation, but uh, I would love to also have fold in some of our participant reflections. Uh, is there anyone who would like to to jump on the microphone? To feel free to raise your hand. Uh, let's see, uh, Karen. Okay, I'll, I'll jump on here. I, oh gosh, I'm loving this. Uh, yes, Barbara, what you just uh, spoke about, what arose in me was uh, um, my understanding of biological evolution on this planet. And then we've got the geology of the planet. And this is a geological formation behind me. The tissue, the living tissues of our mother, the earth, the earth, our mother. It's a very slow metabolism. But when we come to biological evolution, Barbara, it, it's what you were just talking about. It's a, I mean, for a billion years, they were just single celled critters, just lots and lots, very simple, you know, no nucleus. And then you got complex cells because some of the simple cells invaded other cells and they took up a symbiotic relationship. And you get cells that are now very complex, 10, up to 10,000 times larger with lots of subparts. And then after a while, those cells started specializing. And this mirrors the process of human civilization. They start specializing and then clustering together and exchanging, like I'll give you some um, chemical energy and you give me um, some food for me and and so that set us on the path to multi-celled critters so we see over and over in the history of the universe these the next emergent level of complexity where we humans need a whole new science or type of science to study it specialization aggregation exchange and then 
a new organism, a, a new unity. And I like to think of Mother Earth as, I mean, this is, this is what I just heard you. I mean, this is what I was um, hearing in the back of my mind while listening to you talk, Barbara. This has been, this kind of process has been going on for mm -hmm. a long time, you know, back to the Big Bang. We are not finished. I mean, we <laughs> are just the next step and we're in the middle of a major transition where a next new major world order is coming online as of complexity that's never been seen before that we know of. So yeah. under the impact of that, old structures are breaking down. And so we've got this chaos that screams at us in the headlines. And, you know, but, you know, this is one of my shtick and uh, some of the people here have heard this before. Even as humans, we've been through transitions like this six times before. Now this is bigger than the previous ones, but I mean, that's why we're all running around with our hair on fire and waving our hands. But, you know, we've, we have a track record here, 13.82 billion years of structures of great, ever greater complexity emerging and per Gebser and Teilhard de Chardin, especially, these structures of greater complexity um, carry consciousness of greater, you know, complexity. And now we're talking about being conscious in four dimensions, yes. right? And there's a lot, actually, there's a lot of this, I mean, there, there's a lot that can be said about this, but we can be conscious in five dimensions. I mean, the, you fold the science into this and you've got string theory and now this uh, quantum gravity, they're talking in all seriousness about eight dimensions and 11 dimensions. That we can we be know. conscious, yeah. And, and you know, this, <laughs> this is the potential for consciousness to be conscious in more than just these, these physical bodies. I mean, a lot of you work with subtle energies. So, you know, there's more to the physical body than our Western science talks about. And as our consciousness grows, as these structures of greater complexity grow, our consciousness will also expand. I mean, it's very confusing at first, but then these new structures knit together and I guess this is kind of a ramble, just I'm just kind of riffing off of what you guys have been saying, but I want to go in by going back to what um, Brandt started with. I Thank you. I'm not familiar with Aurobindo, but I love that image you started with, Brandt, of the, the mother appearing <laughs> to William Irwin Thompson in that dream. And then he says, wait, this is my thing. I'm, I'm not doing your thing. I'm doing my thing. And then she zaps him with the Shakti. <laughs> I would like... <laughs> Oh yeah, go, you go mama earth, you go girl. Um, I would like to end with a suggestion that we are to the earth our mother as the cells of our physical bodies are to yeah. our bodies. We are in ourselves, we are complete, we are holons in Ken Wilber's term, but we are also small parts of something so much bigger yeah. that really does have its own um, um, ontology, its own self-existence. We are parts of the body of the earth, our mother. And man, she's got a plan. She's part of it. I mean, there, 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 there's, there's much more out there and that we're only just starting to intuit and discover. So it's just kind of, I, I usually end up rambling like this, Jeremy and the other folks know, but yeah, this is, this is part of a much larger picture. And we'll get back to some kind of equilibrium when this next new emergent structure emerges and hopefully it won't be quite so cataclysmic. Thank I'll you. I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I've been using this. I love this, you know, we have a natal pact with Gaia, with the earth, which means we need her for our ongoing development and evolution like a child needs a mother. Joshua Park says uh, becoming Gaia. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's actually a, a title of a forthcoming text coming out of Revlor. So stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, no, I, th I think that's is um, important becoming Gaia and becoming the planetary here. Uh, you don't get away from Mother Shakti in this, you know, <laughs> and then we, like I said earlier, this is a falling in, like, how are we going to embrace this fall? Like we are being drawn to this. This is kind of a, um, something that has initiated us into this new ontology, the itself that we might speak of in a spiritual sense. How do we, how do we respond to that? How do we participate in that? Our volition is important, right? And we can choose to take that leap and that trust that Gebser speaks of, that primal trust 
in this dynamic self transformation and actually tune into what is breaking apart, what is being disrupted? How can we learn from that? How can we move with this process or we can resist it and, and we will still fall into it. It's just not going to be as pretty. It's just not going to be as necessarily uh, transformational for us, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Conscious surrender. To, to speak to that mm -hmm. or just, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> I would just like to say that, um, the self agency is really key. Um, I've had this discussion with Devashish about, you know, well, you know, I don't, you know, there's this thought that uh, I live in a body, the body's going to evolve, I just need to kind of trust that and I don't, you know, the body knows what it's doing. But the fact is, we actually this this is a vehicle, a vehicle of evolution that has to be driven, which means that you have to inhabit it and you have to develop all the aspects. And so I asked him about that and he, you know, to acknowledge that I have this incredible body that knows how to adapt and evolve is one thing, okay? But to actually develop a relationship with it, to actually uh, participate in it brings a whole other complement to the consciousness than if I wasn't engaging in it. If I was just going to sit back and say, well, evolution will have its way with me. But to actually add the consciousness in, it's like putting a driver in the driver's seat. That wouldn't be there. It would be like more like a self-driven, you know, the self-driven car or the automatic car as opposed to driving the... So... I think that um, this idea that I can participate and have some agency for me is very comforting, knowing that so many things are out of my control, such as climate acceleration and even climate collapse. But knowing that I actually do have some uh, agency in how I want to live my life, even if that life is just another, you know, 20 years. Um, I know that I want to uh, participate because participation means taking some kind of care, taking some kind of cultivation, taking the responsibility to create the conditions uh, of my life and my vitality. Otherwise, it just doesn't have any purpose for me. So I think the agency and autonomy in create in participating with this is is absolutely key. Would you agree, Brent? Yes. Yeah, and, and I would say that in a sense what's profound about that is what we're talking about through this whole process, through billions of years, we could describe as the breath of life unfolding. Right. right. And that's unfolding from its single cell. The moment that becomes two, it's, it's the breath of life has created a yin and yang. A and through all of the systems, that yin and yang is always present. That basis, that unity and that yin and yang are always present. So moving through all of that, it's that we get to the point of the descent is the return. And the return is the descent. The catabasis is the most significant part. It's that we take in the new with our breath. Mm -hmm. With every breath, we're taking in the new. We're taking in, we're initiating the process that drives the process of becoming. Mm -hmm. our, our becoming is as naturally unfolding as the breaths that we take. The question is, as you pointed out, Barbara, how deeply are we breathing? Mm -hmm. How deeply into ourselves do we take that breath? Right. And if you posit, you know, the Zhuangzi, in Zhuangzi, we have a set statement that says the sage breathes from the heels. <laughs> so our it. breath doesn't just stop at our abdomen. Our breath can go all the way to the heels. And what are the heels? The heels are where we make our contact, you know, one of the places where we make our contact against the earth. What form of contact? The contact that will leave, that has to be able to press in to make movement go forward. Yeah. 
Beautiful. Right. It has to pivot it, to make that step. You have to pivot into it, mm -hmm. breathing to the heel. Now that means that means that every one of those moments between breaths at the in breath between breath, at the out breath is that what's driving that is the liminality. It, the, what's driving that is the state that we're in now where we're between states. And it's the taking inward and downward and for that oxygen to come in and then permeate through all of our cells to drive the activity of all of the cells is the means by which that transformation can possibly be enacted. And an aspect of that is that there is yet individuality within that. There is yet this set of lungs that are doing that. There is yet my awareness that I am a, a, an agent of change. I am an agent of, I have, have to have become an individual to be cognizant of the degree of my capacity for transformation, mm. to become truly an agent of a means for Gaia to transform it was necessary for us to come into individuality to recognize our selfhood as that. Mm. And that <laughs> means that, that that same process is itself a falling into our being, mm -hmm. just like the breath going to the heels. Beautiful. Thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love that little uh, thing we can do now. That's beautiful, Brent. Um, you know, it, it, it really kind of real helps you realize that we, we are participating integrally in the integrum just by being here, <laughs> being able to engage in this way, walking the earth, breathing with our lungs. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Debashish talking about the fold as this sort of continuum between the inner and the outer, uh, the exterior and the interior is this sort of continuous loop. And the folding in of of the cosmos into the individual is 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 this breathing, this pressing with yeah. the heel that you're describing. You know, it's Can as simple as that. Real quick? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So in so we would say in Chinese medicine, right? The organs that represent the internal, the channels represent the external, right? There's your interior organs and then there's your exterior body and muscles appear to be more exterior to the individual organs and so on. But in, there's a chapter in the text that's called the Ling Shu. And that Ling Shu means spiritual pivot. A Shu is a pivot, the spiritual pivot. That's a way of describing the needle. The needle is a spiritual pivot that creates a re-territorialization as I've described before. Now, that starts from the description of the lung. Ling Shu chapter 10 starts out with a description that describes the pathway of all the channels. And it always starts with the lung. If somebody goes and decides they're gonna study acupuncture, the first channel that they learn is always the lung, right? So it's built into the pedagogy. It's built into the conception of the body that it starts there in a certain way. The circulation, the vital circulation starts there. Now here's what's amazing. It says the lung channel emerges. It says the lung emerges at this acupuncture point, right? It names an acupuncture point. The lung emerges there. It doesn't say the lung channel starts there. It doesn't say the lung channel emerges there. It says the lung emerges there. Hmm. Interesting. Here, I'm pointing at the wrong finger. <laughs> so, Right, that, that's, a, that's a way that sh that's demonstrating precisely how the internal that we conceive of it as the organs is actually present externally. And this point, this channel that starts here and this channel that starts here are a pair. They're poised together. And they both reflect precisely what's happening internally. So it's there in our body all the time when you, can, when, you have, when you have a lens to see, you can see the internal out externally and you can see the relationship of the external to the internal and that they're co-penetrating all the time. I think we could have easily 
rename this embodying the fold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just all the ways we're talking about doing that. Um, let's let's get uh, Veronica. She, uh, so you have your hand raised for a question. Yeah, a very quick one. Uh, I just finished the ballet class, so I'm really, really physically understanding everything you're talking about. But my question is, in terms of education, it all has to do, I mean, it's this competition and this pressure because I'm thinking about contributions like Feldenkrais, Alexander Technique, uh, Coltrane Graf Durkheim, a number of people who really, through very simple methods, wanted to bring people, and like Barbara said very well, people don't want to feel anything anymore. People want OBEs and astral travel and all kinds of, uh, uh, but not the understanding or even the desire to feel. And so how about, how are we going to convey at an early age, this necessity, this natural capacity to feel and maybe introduce very simple techniques that somebody can do at home. Even yoga classes are competitive now. Mm. Yeah. Anarchy. <laughs> Yeah, anarchism, mean, anarchism. That's the answer. <laughs> Free. I, I think, Veronica, it does have to start really young. And I know that um, I have some friends who are involved in childhood education and, you know, Montessori schools and schools that are sort of more um, focused on the development of the whole child versus just this scholastic, you know, or accelerated learning. Um, it has to start young. And um, oftentimes it's the parents that need to model to the child that having feelings are okay. And that expressing feelings are okay. A child is not gonna express feelings if the mother is not expressing feelings because there is sort of like a, a, a pact an unspoken pact in the home where feelings are not really shared and not really safe. So it has to start with children, but it also has to start with families, mothers and fathers who create an atmosphere where feelings are certainly uh, welcome and can be processed in a sort of safe way instead of shaming or may a child be made to feel weak because they particularly, you know, little boys, if they have these deep feelings. And a lot of children, believe it or not, have a lot of really deep feelings right now about what's happening. Not being able to be in school with their peers, not being, you know, understanding like here in California, how every year we have these devastating fires and they have to leave their homes. And so I can guarantee you that children are feeling a lot and we need, you know, as I said, places where people feel, children feel safe. And that starts at home, but it also needs to be in the schools and also needs to be part of our society and culture moving forward as this becomes the norm. Yeah, and non-competitive. I think it has to, I don't think it has to start in childhood. I think it has to not stop in childhood. <laughs> Yeah. It has to be allowed <laughs> to express itself beyond childhood. And in that, I will say like the, one of the most inspiring things, examples of that is like forest schools. Are you familiar with forest schools? No, but I love it. Well, that's one of the reasons, that's practically one of the reasons we moved to Portland was because there was one. And I mean, just look, of course it's, you know, pioneered in, in some Scandinavian country, I imagine. But, you know, like we, I think it was Denmark actually. We have like, um, I think perhaps one of the, and Ellen will, I think, agree with this, like perhaps one of the most profound, uh, perhaps one of the most profound um, frontiers for our, of freedom is with children. You know, the degree to which we, the degree to which we will fall back upon um, 
authority in our relationships with children rather than recognizing the intrinsic freedom and the intrinsic awareness and awareing and knowledge that children are expressing all the time. I, I really, I really, I honestly think, you know, like that's, that's one of the last, that's one of the biggest obstacles to our real, realization of true freedom is to, is to extend that to children. Beautiful. So it's just funny that that yeah. came up. Uh, I want to get to Randolph and then Adam, and then I think Steve after that has his hand raised. So welcome, Randolph. Hi, thanks. This has been such a wonderful conversation. Um, and behind all of it is, um, of course, Gebser's general thesis and all the the many, many specific things he says that, um, that frame... Um, at least for many of us, frame a perspective on the kind of integral philosophies, deep ecology, integral psychology, um, you know, and the kind of metaphysics we find like in Ken Wilber, you know, um, but also in in modern and ancient theosophy and, um, and in many of the, the aspects of the things that we're talking about, like, um, uh, was it uh, Veronica just came from ballet right, uh, the kind of dance that, that you appreciate as a, a deeper, um, more significant spiritual thing. Um, Karen mentioned the theosophy, you know, and um, the psychology, and even, even in the, the play of, of children in Oregon, in the forest, <laughs> you know, all these themes have behind them a kind of um, uh, a background in, in the, and a presence of the harmony of the spheres, this ancient Pythagorean notion, but really a perennial, um, harmonic, uh, you know, idea of harmony and uh, re-enchantment that, that is a possibility since our um, narrative of the fall, something we can, we can achieve again, right? So we're looking for this integral form in the framework of Gebser's um, integration through steps in the, uh, the dim dimensional unfolding of consciousness that gives us a kind of um, a theoria or a, a way of seeing a future state of consciousness that we're looking forward to in many different ways, maybe theoretical physics, um, some of the forms of speculation in theoretical physics we find about a hyperspace of a fourth spatial dimension. You know, this is what I was mentioning in the chat. I'm, I'm especially interested in, in, this, in this idea of um, we're in a kind of sphere. There are many spheres metaphorically, but there's also literally um, spheres of dimensional continua just in the mathematical ontological sense that, that, um, that like the, the, the Agrafa dogmata, the, the Platonic school and the, the Neoplatonic um, uh, tradition of Mathesis Universalis as Philosophia Perennis, this great chain of being of love joy, um, you know, the scala natura, this theme of the harmony of the spheres. And um, we're in a sphere, right? We're positioned in terms of our continuum in this Minkowski Einstein space time, three plus one dimensionality is one way of looking at it, right? And, um, and Gebser. And, um, and certain other people he mentions, like Hedvig Conrad Martius, um, even Ernst Mach, the, the beginning of psychophysics in psychology, and other um, German critical realist thinkers that he mentions in Ever Present Origin, um, talk about this idea of moving into a fourth spatial dimension. So it's not just Gebser, but um, you know, it's a very interesting topic of theosophy, anthroposophy, they talk about these topics. So um, I think of a lot of like what we're talking about in terms of like um, the current issues like the pandemic and um, uh, the, the faults we find in, in a reductive form of education and psychology and so on, you know, um, have a lot to do with this in, in the Gebserian frame, um, moving into a fourth spatial dimension and how that might then relate to things like a fifth dimension, a sixth dimension, you know. And, um, and of course, this is all within the framework of um, maybe infinitely many dimensions, not just 26 or whatever, you know, Kaluza Klein string theory or whatever's hot right now, you know, might speculate. But, um, you know, so, so anyway, I've, I've been mentioning this topic in, in, the, in the text because um, a lot of what we're talking about can certainly fit in through, through the, the place that Gebser has in, in all of these areas, um, you know, a way of plugging into this ancient and perennial, but also future um, metaphysics of the harmony of the spheres, and especially the idea of the infinite sphere, this paradoxical idea, especially from Nicholas of Cusa, from the book of the 24 philosophers, 
um, Giordano Bruno and, and so on. So many people have used this, this guiding motif, this theme. And that's exactly what has been lost with what Nietzsche calls the death of God. You know, the secularization of the sciences, the naturalization of, of humanity, right? And uh, what Husserl talks about in the crisis, even, even Heidegger who departs from him in, in respects, um, still appreciates that there is a kind of crisis related to technology and this reductive attitude, the naturalistic attitude, you know. Um, so anyway, I, I'm just, I just wanted to keep reinserting this, this weird, you know, um, sci-fi idea of a fourth spatial dimension that is in many different ways, not just metaphorically, but also physically on the horizon, you know, and, and is certainly at home in all of the, the new age themes that we're talking about with the integral, you know, different disciplines under a general um, big discipline or, you know, not specific discipline, but a, a more a freeing paradigm, an ancient and perennial, yeah. Anyway, I'm rambling, but but I, I just think it's relevant. So, you know, where I-, is I that, Where is that Randolph? In, in, in ever present origin, there's the- Where is it happening in your body? Oh, Where in the do you body. Feel that? Where do you feel that within you? Well, um, you know, Blaise so, Pascal. Move into that, not that awareness. It's in you somewhere. It is. It has a. It it inter. It intersects with your physical being somewhere. Where? Yeah, all around. And you brought up the in and out. You know, dimension of of the the. In Ehrlichkeit, the inner dimension and versus an outer dimension. You know, this is the theme of the infinite sphere, which is paradoxical in a way, but is also um, we experience it um, in all the cells, in every way of looking at our body and our psychophysical life world. You know, there's an in and an out, and the infinite sphere would be this, um, you know, this circumference that is nowhere, but in the sense of like the mystical ungrund, the the kind of abgrund, the the nothing that's that's um, it's not nothing, but it's that that plenum, mm -hmm. it's, it's you know the the um the plenum, right? And and then this this is what we're feeding on when we have these mechanisms that that move forward. It's what we're feeding on when we bite into an apple, <laughs> and to and be present with that, be present with that awareness as you bite into the apple, right? Like that sphere is as you're saying. Of course, it's all around us. It is us. We're not in space, space is moving as us. Mm. And every moment, every bite we take in, every bite of that natural world that we consume becomes our flesh. And when we recognize that our flesh is partaking of that very state of the, spe of the sphere, mm -hmm. then we can bring our awareness to that one moment when that process is initiated, the moment the Husserlian return to the thing itself, where we can, ex we can feel that experience, recognize that experience, take it into our being as sensory reality. Mm -hmm. And to perceive yeah. at that moment that it's constantly, that, that, single taste receptor is exploding into a cosmos of its ever present becoming. Yeah. I would and just to be like, present with every aspect of that. Yeah. Um, that's, thank you, Brent. And also Randolph, I would like to say, you know, I, I work in this area with bodies and embodiment I have for 20 years and I bring a, 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 a big lens uh, to my work with clients, you know, Sri Aurobindo and the mother's work, Tullier de Chardin, Gebser, they've all informed my ideas. And I'm so excited when a new client comes and oftentimes a new client will just say to me, I just want to get in my body. I just want to feel something. I feel numb. So yes, I understand there's all of that, but the, there, there is a real alienation from the human body, just like there's a real alienation from the earth. And until we find some sense of belongingness in this universe, all of those ideas don't mean anything. Did you say longingness? B 
belongingness. Oh. oh, because I think you can't spell belonging without longing. <laughs> you know, until we, you know, you can't longing. have a sense of belonging Be to longing. the planet if you don't, if you're alienated from your body. So yeah. all these great ideas, I love them. I love that you brought them in here. But the basic premise is we, we need to feel our bodies as a part of the earth first before we can go into these other dimensions yes well and into the spiritual earth as well like plato talks about a spiritual earth you know and these longings are the spaghettifications as we fall into the event horizon into this this higher body like like the the christian theme is is that of a reintegration into a, a higher spiritual body that is also physical so I mean that that's the kind of world that I'm I'm like trying to look forward yeah. to maybe through the concepts of theoretical physics and hyperspace. But in if I could, uh, well. if I could also fold in some of Gebser's words about this, uh, particularly when he talks about the concept of the fourth dimension, his commentary on that. But even earlier when he's describing things like cystasis and and um, uh, how do we approach integral concepts, integral thinking, integral philosophizing as as is certainly an important aspect here. Um, he talks about relating these quantitative extensities where we're talking about measurement or dimensionality or hyperspace or hyperplanes um, with qualitative intensities. As long as they are transparent to each other, as long as they are in relation to each other in that way, then there's no, there's no threat of that kind of being you know, something off the earth, right? It's, it's enfolded into the present, we're transparent to it, and it doesn't threaten to kind of dissociate us from biting the apple. If we can see those topologies and, and feel them in our body and biting the apple, and then also be able to immediately grok, like, absolutely, there's all of this other commentary and theoretical physics, etc., that is talking about the same understanding. If that is transparent between the two, I think that that is where the integrality comes through. Um, and just to l give a line from, from that section, um, uh, he says, the introduction of mere time into, into the traditional concept of space will bring about only a partial supersession, and yet a supersession tantamount to a liberation must be achieved, not merely a spatial expansion, which leads to spatial destruction. Three-dimensional space cannot be destroyed by a four-dimensional continuum any more than two-dimensional space can be destroyed by a three-dimensional space. The liberation from the world of one less dimension in any given instance is principally a liberation from the exclusive validity of the lesser dimension structures. Viewed in these terms, the adaptation by rational science of the concept of a fourth dimension that employs a time concept, which is no longer absolute, but relative, is an initial point of departure toward a fourth dimensional consciousness of integrality and pers a perspective. He's is initializing. It opens it up. It no longer allows it to be exclusive, right? And I think that's important. Um, but I think this transparency is, is also where when it comes down to biting the apple can we continue to do that loop um you know between the concepts and the actual material expression and the spiritual concretization um but yes uh th thank you randolph uh these are, this is great um let me let me get adam and then steve and i think then we have to close up because we've been going a little over well uh thank you everyone can y'all hear me okay yeah yes perfect uh, following all of that is going to be really difficult. And, um, and, and so let me start by saying this has just been one of the most brilliant conversations. I have gotten so much out of this today. So thank you all very much for, for being present and showing up. Um, so, so to take it back to something that Brant said earlier, um, when, he, when you said um, uh, breathing from the heels, it, it reminded me of this. Um, um, I just got through reading a really great book called Sand Talk by uh, Tyson Yokoporta. It's uh, how indigenous thinking can save the world. And towards the end of this book, um, Tyson uh, has this meditation where he starts to talk about the mind and how the mind is not uh, in the brain and how we are in the Western world, we think that, that it's encapsulated in the brain. And so he starts this meditation of like visualize a fire and visualize the warmth of the fire and visualize the crackling and just put yourself in this, this you, you know, feel the warmth and then take that and bring it down into your heart 
and feel that warmth in your heart and feel that fire, but feel that mind being in the heart and then feel it being in your belly where you're, you're big, he calls it the big power. And so like I did this and I could feel the warmth. I could like viscerally feel this fire in my belly and in my heart and like all throughout my body. So it was a really powerful meditation. And, and now it's become a practice for me of being able to ground the mind in the body and know that it's not just in the brain where, where we usually, you know, feel it to reside. And so then like, it would be uh, very easy to, you know, take that and bring it into the planet and be able to like inhabit and incorporate that, that sense of feltness into, you know, into our, our planetary being as well as our own individual and as well as the collective. So, so when you said that, it would, it just really, it, it really like resonated with me because I could, I could, I have felt that recently. And so I just wanted to comment on that. Can I make a recommendation? One more recommendation for you. Absolutely. Do you do, you do cold showers at all? <laughs> I have, and they are incredibly awakening, you know, things. Yeah. Well, so next time you take a shower, take a nice, hot, warm, pleasant shower, mm -hmm. and then do that process mm -hmm. while you have that cold water on you. Okay. Because you can, because that's exact, that's because that's exactly what your body will do in response to that cold is it will go, it'll get you out of your head, down mm -hmm. through your heart, right into your gut, to your kidneys. And then that warmth will come back out and you'll feel like a, there will be a split second moment where you can feel both the cold from outside and the heat from inside and be s s aware of both of them simultaneously and not feel the cold as separate. Wow. That sounds really powerful. Yeah. And you, yeah. And it'll, it'll be, it'll be, it sounds like what you're, what you're practicing is powerful mm, mm. and explore it, just explore it, play with it. Yeah. Thank you. Any thoughts, Barbara? On that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> well, thank you, Adam. I appreciate your reflections and your, your sharing. Um, okay. We got uh, Steve queued up. And then we got to close. Um, yeah, fantastic session. Um, I I want to talk. Um, I've been a forest school facilitator for about 14, 15 years. And um, one of the things of doing it with all sorts of kids of all ages, I mean, but towards the end, I don't do it so much now, but it, it was um, kind of multi-generational home ed groups. And what came out of it, and what's um, I think it's generally started to be thinking it, is that actually you can shift kids and tune kids in actually where, from whatever background really pretty quickly. But what is it absolutely imperative is that they need a container to go back into. And actually the project I'm, or was until COVID came along and screwed the whole thing up, was that I was starting for a school for grandparents. Basically, that you needed grandparents because parents are out being busy all the time, but you, the grandparents can be there to ask the questions and hold the space. What did you experience? What was that bird? What flowers did you see? What fungi was that? Who lives there? Where did the wind come from? You know, it's the asking of questions. So it was, it, I think it's so important. There's a huge role for elders to actually hold the space for the young to thrive, but without it, they just get crushed and end up on a computer game or whatever, you know? Yeah, there's two, two things I would mention to, about that. One is one of the most remarkable things that I observed in China consistently that always was coming to my attention was that the youngest amongst them were always with the oldest of them. Every time you saw a kid, there was an a, a 80 year old in tow. Yeah. unquestionably and that's so profound the second thing is that anytime I ever tell people about forest school probably 75 percent of the time the first response is well I want to go there 
This is pretty and, cool. <laughs> and I had the experience and, and basically, you know, I, I, th I had that same thought when my son was in that school, I was like, man, you know, I wish I could spend every day in the woods. And then I realized, you know what, you're an adult, you can <laughs> choose it. You know, if that's your choice, choose it. So anyway. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Barbara, any, any comments on that or reflections? No, um, yeah. I think that uh, what I what I'm sort of feeling is that um, if we if we don't feel safe in our body for whatever reason, trauma, um, you know, even people having to wear masks and children not being with peers, you know, if, if, if there's this underlying anxiety and we don't feel safe in our bodies, it's very, very difficult for our organism to adapt. You know, it's almost like this, you know, I mean, you know, this uh, brand, the, the, the real state of self-healing and the real state of, um, let's say, adaptive behavior, um, mutations, transformations happen when there is a, a, some, you know, when the parasympathetic, let's say, is, is, is innervated. And the parasympathetic has been getting a lot of um, Air, airway lately, just be airwaves lately, because so many people are uh, in ang anxiety and also trauma response. So um, I just wanted to say that all, all of this sounds wonderful. And um, at the same time, maladaptive behavior happens, which means, you know, that we're not really um, inhabiting or embodying our full potential as human organisms. So I think it's important to remember that, that safety uh, is key to feeling at home and at peace in a body. And um, unless we address the collective trauma that we are really going through now on the planet, uh, a lot of these ideas just will not really be embodied. So I think it's important to remember that. And, um, and I know that we can, you know, biohack our parasympathetic. I mean, I've been watching parasympathetic summits and they're basically showing people how they can uh, hack their, ner their uh, parasympathetic nervous system. Um, one of the most easiest ways is sound, believe it or not, singing or making sounds because the vagus nerve comes through the throat and into the heart and into the gut. And the vocal cords are one of the most direct ways to actually um, innervate the vagus nerve. So singing and making sound and also playing music are, is one of the most uh, healing things we can do for ourselves. So I just wanted to say that. I don't know why I wanted to say it, but I just think it's important to acknowledge that there is, there are a lot of people having a really difficult time uh, on the planet right now. And we're seeing a lot of maladaptive behavior. And so that this concerns me a little bit. Um, but at the same time, I also embrace the idea that, you know, it takes only a few uh, change can happen with very few. And, you know, the mother's work was really about uh, her and Sri Aurobindo uh, were trying to uh, create this next evolutionary path and they achieved it. And they said, all it takes is one person because it's kind of like, once one human being has the capacity to already inhabit this space, bodies convey and transmit this information. Just like the hundred monkey, you know, when the monkey starts washing its fruit, it 
way across on another continent, the monkeys start to do that. So they're, you know, we really are one body, so to speak, one body of life. And uh, the more of us that can wake up and consciously inhabit ourselves as this unfolding um, human organism, it will begin to transmit. It will begin to be, uh, gen you know, um, transduced. I love that word, transduction, transduced, which means input from one form to another. Um, I don't know why I felt that was important to just fold in. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Brent, or... I just have one thing to say. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> well thank you barbara thank you brent thank you everybody for a wonderful inaugural mutations patreon extension session whatever we call these going forward we're going to have many more uh i've posted all the links to everything in the in the in the the chat here so if you are not a patreon go ahead and check that out if you like this we do this every every wednesday <laughs> um and then there's also a discord channel and the newsletter so stay tuned uh, i believe next month we're probably going to have adam ray atkins to talk about acid communism mark fisher aesthetics and temporics and we're also going to have michelle bowens on to talk about peer-to-peer -peer and answer questions after our podcast and i am sure brant barber will we'll be back together and, and converge once again. So <laughs> thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.